So in the past chapter, we had some basic concepts like friction force, spring force, and some other stuff, gravity, which is not really difficult. I mean, friction is sometimes tricky because you have to understand the direction of motion <clears throat> to find out which way friction goes. But outside that, that wasn't too complicated. But when you do problems, we had three approaches, right? Uh, X, Y, Z coordinate system, <clears throat> normal tangential coordinate system, and polar. Now I can give you two problem of each. It may not be enough. You saw we solved some problems, each of them had different approach. <clears throat> My point is you need to practice enough number of problems for dynamics to be able to implement those techniques or combine them. So the point is you have to be exposed to different techniques or different approaches. Hopefully you remember them. And when you get a new problem, you see which one or which combination of those approaches you need to use. That's what happens with dynamics, okay? As we move forward, some chapters are more straightforward. Some chapters are more tricky, but the slight difference between the statics and dynamics is the diversity of the concepts here is a little more than statics. The level of difficulty is similar, I agree. Maybe dynamics a little more. So what I'm gonna do, I will reduce the number of submitted homework problems and give like two, three, just to, to solve it, okay? But remember the condition. If I see you guys go back to online resources and stuff like that, I may have to trigger disciplinary actions against whoever does this. Because I said in the middle of, in the beginning, I may say it, I usually say in my classes that we are a team, we work together, we need to have a mutual understanding. For me, it's okay. If you have any suggestions and recommendations like what we discussed, right? You know what, the, the homework problems are too many. I can give you less. It doesn't mean you solve less problem, you understand everything. Every student has a different, you know, pace of learning. But regardless of how many you need to solve, you need to do it yourself, okay? So if I see, as I said, some irregular activities, I may have to report it. And I do this reduction of homework problems to accommodate your time limitation, okay? This is it a good plan? Okay. Now, with that discussion, let's go to um, slides. Let me share the screen. This new chapter that we're gonna to cover today and maybe on Wednesday is about work energy method. As I mentioned before, and hopefully you remember last week or the week before, when you, when you analyze dynamics problem, there are two way of looking at it. One is the kinematics, which is just the motion, velocity, acceleration, displacement. We talk about that extensively in chapter 12, right? <clears throat> and one is kinetics, where the cause of motion come into play. For kinetics, there are different approaches. One approach was Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration, right? <clears throat> we can also use work energy method and as you will see in the next chapter next week or sometime maybe on friday we also do impulse momentum now as we move forward i give you the difference between them just to remind you what we did in chapter 13 <clears throat> if you noticed in chapter 13 every problem we saw was for a specific moment right at this position, find the accelerations or find the reaction forces or things like that. So Newton's second law is applied to one single moment. I mean, you can apply it to any time, but when you solve it, you solve it for one single moment. <clears throat> Work energy, in contrast, 
is between two points as we talk about in like a few minutes, right? So you cannot solve work energy problems at single moment. It has to go from A to B, from distance A for between two different you know, positions. Having that in mind, <clears throat> let's just start with the concepts. So what we're gonna learn here is just the definition of work. I'm sure you all remember from <clears throat> even the statics or from physics or high school. Then we're gonna calculate the force done by some of typical mechanical forces like gravity, elastic force, and friction. <clears throat> so these are typical forces we deal with. Then we define mechanical energy and we deal with principle of work and energy how mechanical work and mechanical energy are related and after that we talk about conservative forces and potential energy and extend the relation between work and energy <clears throat> i'm sure you have heard of these things before and you have dealt with them in Physics, is this right? Like physics one, you review these things, right? It's just, we go with the more depth <clears throat> for particles. So the first thing is the work done by a force F or summation of forces is a scalar quantity. Remember force is vector, but the work is a scalar. And do you guys remember what the scalar quantity means, right? Hi, Z. What is a scalar? Give me an example. Work is one of them. What it means? <clears throat> uh, it is uh, uh, <clears throat> it has no it has no direction. It's just uh, uh, just a uh, no, just a number. Exactly. Any other examples of scalar? I think we talked about this before, right? Kelly, do you remember another example? Um, I don't remember a good example. Okay, Jake, how about you? We have two Jakes, like Jake Baltus. And the speed limit going that way? No, give me a physical quantity that is a scalar. Like work is a scalar. It's just a number. What else? Ben. Ricardo? Mm, could it be like uh, speed or weight? Speed has direction, right? When we, I mean, speed is, if you consider a speed as just a number, you may say yeah. a scalar, but velocity as we extend it in general is a vector. Weight is force and force is vector. I know we usually use weight with just a number, right? But it has a direction going, you know, downward toward oh, the center. Yeah. So, how about temperature? Right? Temperature is just a number. It doesn't have direction, right? Pressure is just a number. Of course, pressure is always perpendicular to the surface, but knowing that is, is, is just a number. So, <clears throat> work like temperature, like time, time is always number is a scalar. So the way we define it, I think you remember, if you have a vector force, and when you have a displacement of the force going from A to A prime, the amount of work done by this force is force times displacement in the direction of force. That means if you go this way, displacement in the direction of force has to be in this direction, parallel to this. And if you consider that displacement in this direction is like dr cosine alpha times f, it's going to be the force, <laughs> right? We're going to go small displacement, so we're kind of we're going to call it dr. And remember, r is a vector, force is a vector, but we use their magnitude here with cosine alpha. And this small dr displacement creates a small work du. In some textbooks, 
they use W for work. To be honest with you, I prefer W too. But any course I teach, I try to stick with the, you know, what the textbook gives. Your textbook uses U for work, so I'm going to stick with that one. Now, two vectors multiply by one another and multiply by the cosine of the angle between them. Remember, if this is F, this is dr, alpha is the angle between the two vectors. Does that remind you anything? Two vectors interacting with each other, creating a scalar, cosine theta or cosine alpha is involved. Do you remember anything from your math stuff? Maybe not. That is how we define dot products. Now you remember what dot product is, right? The dot product is between two vectors. Its magnitude is the magnitude of the two vectors multiplied by one another times the cosine of the angle between them. And dot product creates a scalar. So technically, two vectors interacting with one another creating a scalar, cosine the angle involved, you use that product. So du could be f dot dr. Any question about this? Now, considering, let's go back here. <clears throat> when you talk about work, the force has to move going from one point to another. If it's infinitesimal like differential displacement, or you may drive from Edwardsville to Chicago, or you, I don't know, fly somewhere, or you go to moon, it has to be between two points. As I said, unlike Newton's second law that you solve it for a single position, when we talk about work, it has to be between two points. <clears throat> now, if you go from one point to another, look at here again, as you move, the direction of force could change, right? The, it's a vector, it could be variable. Based on the curvature of the path of motion, the direction of dr could change. So technically you have two variable vectors, and if you want to find the overall magnitude of going from like this point, to that point, then you have to integrate it between the two points, right? So if you integrate it to two points, ds is the length of the path, because if dr is a small, dr and ds are the same. So f cosine alpha ds, you integrate it from S1 to S2, and the work done, you usually you write it u12, which means the work done from going from point one, point two. And you guys have seen this in your physics, right? Now, if the force, this is something you may have seen even in high school. If the force is constant and moves on a straight line, which means the force is constant, alpha is constant, they come out of integral, this simply becomes constant force cosine alpha delta S. And that is what the simplest way of doing work. Moving on a straight line, so alpha doesn't change. Having a constant force, F doesn't change. So this integral simplifies as this. What is the unit for work? Do you guys remember? Come on, guys. The unit for work. If you look at the equation, force could be Newton. Displacement could be meter. You could say Newton meter. But Newton meter is also for torque and moment, so we're not going to use that. The unit we had was... Is it joules? 
joules, yes. And one joule is one newton moving one meter, right? Or you can be pound feet, right? Because it's like forces in, in imperial units. It is, the force is pound, the displacement is foot, pound foot. And you can use it that way. You can also use calories. It's more for energy or for like thermal problems, but that's also the unit for work and energy. Now let's talk about the work done by some of the famous mechanical forces we usually deal with. The first one is gravity. And uh, I'm gonna switch to the um, tablet to derive this equation. Might be easier this way. So if you have XYZ system, right? And you have something moving on a general path of motion going from point one to point two. And the gravity is obviously in this direction. If this is the particle P, the gravity, which is W equals mg, goes down. If you consider gravity as a vector, how I can write that vector? And you know what? In the textbook, for some reason, they use Y as vertical components. So let me just make it same way. If this is Y, then this is going to be X and this is going to be Z. Gravity as a vector, if this is the vector, what would be the vector form of W? Would it be like negative MGJ? J, yes. Or negative WJ. Now, if this guy has the position vector of R, which gives you X, Z, and Y component, how I can write R vector is gonna be X, I plus Y, J plus Z, K, and small displacement, because remember, U, one, two, is integration of W, dr, right? From R1 to R2, right? That's how the vector things go, and this is dot product. dr is going to be dxi plus dyj plus dz k. I'm going to use this vector and this vector here. So if that's the case, u12 is going to be integration of from r1 to r2 minus wj dot dr, which is this guy, dxi plus dyj plus dz a. So the, the dot product, when you do it, is just regular product. You just ex expand this. So you're going to get from R1 to R2 
minus wj dot dxi minus or plus minus wj dyj plus minus wj dzk. <clears throat> Do you guys remember the dot product of ijk? These are all dot products, right? So you can say, I'm going to just write one of them. So if you do that, you're going to simply get minus W dx, because they're just numbers, j dot i. What is j dot i, or how much is j dot i? How much is j dot i? Hmm. Zero. Why? I don't know. That's what my physics professor told me, and I went with it. You just trust what we tell you, right? You have a PhD. I don't. You don't need PhD to do this. I explain you why. You remember dot product? We say like the magnitude of first vector, like a dot b. If you want to find the magnitude. I mean, you don't have to do it because A dot B is the scalar already, right? Because if you know this, it's, it's easy to find. It takes like five seconds to get it. If you have C is A dot B as two vectors, this is vector A, this is vector B, right? And it's going to be the magnitude of A times magnitude of B times cosine alpha, the angle between them. Now, when you have i, j, k, the way we have here, what is the angle between them? This should, you, you don't need PhD to know this, Aaron. The angle between i and j, i and k, and j and k. Are 90 degrees. 90 degrees, right? What is the cosine of the 90 degree? Zero. Zero. So when you have i dot j, which is same as j dot i, because you can replace them, switch them, it's going to be zero. Same for i dot k, zero, and then j dot k, right? Now, how is how much is i dot i j dot j and k dot k? One. One. Because if you look at this, the magnitude of unit vectors is one, and the angle between them is going to be zero. So cosine zero is one. So that is what you need to know. And you don't get PhD to know this. I'm going to tease you for the rest of semester with that PhD stuff. Okay. So if that's the case, let's just go back here. Any when you have the dot product, any two other or different unit vectors gives you zero. Technically, this is going to be zero. This is going to be zero. And here, j dot j is going to be one, right? So if I clean this mess a little bit here and write down the whole thing, then you get u12 is equal to integration of just this guy, minus w dy. There's no vector stuff going from y1 to y2, right? Which means if you go up, work, of gravity is negative. If you go down, work is positive. Remember, this cosine theta that we had here, I think I erased it. 
this cosine theta for zero is one, for 180 is minus one. Right? So that is how you get the work of gravity. Something you possibly notice here, and let me get these things back here. If you go from point one to point two, point one, right, has the y of y one, point two has y two, Technically, the work done from one to two only depends on y1 and y2. So it doesn't matter if the path of motion is like this, is like this, is like that. It doesn't matter, right? Because you don't see any s or length of the path. You just see the initial point, the final point, the y values, right? Which means, for example, if you enter the engineering building from the main entrance and take the stairs up or go to the second floor, go to the other side of new extension and take the elevator, go up to the third floor and go to the same point, the work of gravity will be the same. Doesn't matter how you get there, just Y1 and Y2, that's all that matters, okay? And this is what we get here. I just write it shorter version here. So your F is minus WJ, your DR is DX, DY, DZ. You do the dot products, this is zero, this is zero, you get JJ. And then that's what you get. So technically, the work of gravity does not depend on the path of motion. Only initial and final elevation. So if you go up, your delta y is positive because of this negative sign, your work will be negative. If you go down, your y2 is smaller than y1, this becomes negative, negative times negative, positive. So your work is positive. Any question? So that is one of the forces we deal with quite frequently. And we find out how we can calculate it, right? Just delta y times gravity. Now, something here. I suppose W is constant when I did this integral. Is W really constant? For example, if you go from the surface of Earth to, I don't know, this space station 50,000 miles above the surface of Earth, is the W still constant? No, because mg, the value of g changes, right? Or if you go, for example, from, I don't know, Sahara to the top of Mount Everest, your weight will not be constant, okay? Slightly changes. Around the surface of Earth with the regular motions we have, even if you go a couple of thousand feet above the ground or maybe, I don't know, couple of kilometers above the ground, the change of G is so little, we may neglect it and consider weight as constant, okay? Just want to remind you that if your motion is too much, then you may have to consider the gravity, the, the variation of gravity. The next typical mechanical force we dealt with quite frequently is the force of a spring. Now, you may realize that if, look at these two pictures for a second. If 
this box on wheels or cart or whatever you name it. If it goes to the right, suppose that the right side is positive x. <laughs> if it goes to the right, the force of a spring is going to be backward. And if you push it to the, <clears throat> excuse me, if you push it to the left, the force of a spring will be forward, which means the force of a spring and displacement are always in opposite direction, right? You push it this way, the force is that way. You pull it this way, the force is backward. So the final point is for a mechanical spring, the spring force and the, it's the formation are not in the same direction, always with a negative sign. So if that's the case, when you do F dx as vectors, your force and displacement are always in opposite direction. And your force is a function of x. We talked about this in the previous chapter, and you, you know it from even your high school, maybe. So kx is the force. dx is the displacement. The negative sign comes because they're opposing each other, right? Then you take this integral, you get half k x2 square minus x1 square. And that's easy to do, right? So remember the work spring does, which is the force of a spring, is negative. The force, the work that we do, you see this force P? This is external force because the spring may not move by itself. You have to pull it and push it. So the work of P, which is external force stretching a spring, is the same direction of X. And because these two forces balance each other, if there's no acceleration, then the work of P is positive. And this is the work done on the spring. The work done by the spring, which is from this force, is negative. OK? Again. When you do this integral, all you have is initial displacement or deformation of the spring and final deformation of a spring. It doesn't matter how you get from x1 to x2, right? It's just the difference between the two displacements. And remember, I'm going to explain this. A couple of you may still make me this. It's quite a popular mistake that when students solve problems, this X is not the length of the spring. What is it? What is X1 and X2? Or what are? Christopher, what the are X? The displacement? The amount of displacement, the amount of deformation. So if your spring has a neutral length of one meter, how much is X? You have a spring sitting on the somewhere. It's neutral next is one meter. How much is X1? It's zero, right? Because you have not stretched it or compressed it. It's just its own neutral length. If I stretch that from one meter to and make it 1.2, how much is X2? Come on, guys. Jake, the other Jake. I think we don't hear you, Jake. So the length is one. I stretch it and make it 1.2 meter. How much is X? Kelly. 
point two, right? So please remember, I know it's very easy and simple concept, but when you get to solve a problem, it says the length of a spring is like 0.5 meter. You pick that and put as X1. I have seen this so frequently almost in every course, right? At least at the beginning. So make sure when you use this equation, this is not the length of the spring, none of them. This is how much a spring is deformed, either stretched or compressed. Any question? Okay. The next one is the work of gravity. Sorry, a friction. <clears throat> because friction, when an object moves, you have kinetic friction. Remember, for a force to work, you have to have displacement. So if something sits there and you push it and you go to, through a static friction and things don't move, there's no work, right? When things move, then you have kinetic friction. And kinetic friction is constant. So the work of friction, because it's always in opposite direction of motion, it's going to be minus friction times delta S. Right? Did you guys see the blinking stuff to emphasize? Static friction does not do any work. Why? Because if things don't move, there's no displacement of any force. Nothing happens, right? So if you have a heavy fridge in your kitchen and you push it to move around and your force is not enough to move, if you push it for half a day, how much work do you do? zero, right? Because it has to have displacement. And that's static friction. As soon as it starts moving, it becomes kinetic friction. And that's why I have mu k here, right? Because it must be kinetic friction. Any question? The forces that do not work. I just give you an example. Static friction doesn't work, right? What else? Any force that does not move does not work. That includes static friction, reaction forces, because reaction forces don't move. Forces that are normal to the path of motion, right? Imagine you're carrying a heavy suitcase and moving horizontally like in a street. The weight is perpendicular to the ground. Your displacement is horizontal. So the angle between the weight and the displacement is 90 degree. How much work you do? Zero, right? So if you carry something, Moving horizontal. If you go upstairs, different story. But if you move on like a flat horizontal street, road, field, whatever, there will be no work because that is a force normal to the path of motion. So make sure you remember these things. And as you solve a problem, you consider that. Any question? Are we good? Okay. Now, principle of work and energy. You guys know how we define energy, right? Do you remember the definition of energy from your physics? The ability to do some work is called energy. The potential, the ability to work, to do some work is called energy. Now you want to see how we can relate 
work and energy. And look at this example. You have an object, a particle here, moving on a path. It's a curved path going from point one to point two. Point one has a position of S1, point two has a position of S2, and the forces acting here is just general forces could be any direction, right? Now, because we know only the component of work in the direction of displacement does some, the component of force in the direction of displacement does some work, I'm going to divide this force into normal and tangential. So based on what we just said in previous slide, the normal force doesn't do any work, right? The tangential work force is going to do some work. Let's calculate that work. OK? So if I write the general equation of U, summation of U, we put summation of U1, two because you have more than one force. Each of them does some work. So the summation of work of all the forces is the summation of F dot dr for all of them. And if you separate them, F dot dr could turn to Ft ds. Why? Because Ft is in the direction of path. When you use that direction, the tangential component of dr is going to be ds. And that's what you get. And then you don't have to have dot product, just Ft ds. Do you guys understand these two terms? How we go from first one to the second one? Again, we divide the force into normal and tangential. Normal doesn't do any work. Tangential does some work. And the work is coming from F times displacement, F dot ds. OK? Now, let me go to the, uh, to the tablet to drive this one by one. That might be easier. So we end up into this uh, equation. Summation of U12 is integration of Ft ds from S1 to S2. If I want to relate tangential acceleration force to tangential acceleration, can I write that Ft or maybe summation of Ft is m a t? Can I do that? Just what we had in previous chapter. And I'm going to substitute this here. So you're going to get, this is going to be M A T D S S1 to S2. Now, A D S, does that remind you anything from kinematics? I think I need to give you another quiz from chapter 12, right? So isn't that equal to BDV? Exactly. So I'm gonna substitute this guy here. So then if you write summation of U12, integration of M, V, D, V, now you go from V1, to V2. And if you do this integral, of course, you know that it's going to get half mv2 square minus half mv1 square. Right? So 
the work done by external forces is equal to the change of this parameter, half mv squared. Do you remember what we called that guy? Half mv squared? Yun? What we call this guy? That potential energy. It is not potential energy. It's like it's, it's twin brother. Kinetic. Kinetic energy. Yeah. Why? Because you may realize that this term again does not depend on the path of motion. Is the characteristics of the particle at every single point. So when you have something that is characteristic of a system at the same situation. And as you move from one situation to another changes, you can associate some energy or some properties of the system. This is what we call kinetic energy. And again, for some, if that's the case, so if half m v squared, we call it kinetic energy. And for some reason, in your textbook, kinetic energy is shown by T, right? So if we substitute here, you're going to get summation of all work done on that particle is T2 minus T1 or delta T. So technically, the work of all external forces does what changes the kinetic energy of particle. Can you guys read my handwriting? And this is called principle of work and energy. Any question? Okay, now let's go back to the slides. We're gonna see the same thing. So as I said, only tangential component does the work. You write this, you get that, you replace with this. Write the equation, this is what you're going to get, right? And this is what we call kinetic energy. So the work of all external forces, you see, it's a summation of if all this is this includes all of the forces, gravity, friction, if something is pulling or pushing, if there's a spring, everything, right? If even there's electromagnetic force, I know we don't talk about those, but those are all external forces. So if there's any force, the work that all they do together, it's going to be used or consumed or whatever you call it to change the kinetic energy. Which means the final kinetic energy of the system is the initial kinetic of the system, kinetic, sorry, potential energy, of, sorry, kinetic energy of the system plus work of external forces. And we call this as principle of work and energy. Yeah. 
Any question? I'm going to solve one example here to see how it works. Let's just do this one. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the end of railway. Sometimes it reaches, you know, the train station. Some of the trains is just that's the end of the road. Have you seen that? If you look at the end, you see something like this that is there. I mean, much stronger than this, obviously, to stop the train if they don't stop. You may have seen it in some of the action movies when the train hits and just everything explodes and goes around. Theoretically, it's not supposed to happen. So if this slows down but doesn't stop, there's a, some kind of a spring here that absorbs the energy of the train and it stops it. So here, this is like a design problem. You want to design this spring. Your spring is not linear, so their force increases with ks squared. Linear is ks, this is ks squared, and s is again the formation of the spring, right? You have, I don't know why they say five megagram, it's like 5,000 kilogram train, five tons of uh, this train card. It has the initial velocity of four meter per second. And as soon as it touches this spring, you want 200 millimeter of displacement before it stops. You don't want to go too much, right? So if a five, thousand kilogram train car with four meter per second speed hits this spring we want the spring to stop it in 0.2 meter and we want to see how much this k value should be to do that so is the definition of problem clear Let's go to the tablet and uh, see how we solve this guy. So this is technically how the system looks like. You have a spring here, right? This is spring. Its displacement start from here, this S, and your train card has a velocity of, oops, four meter per second. And your spring force goes, as I said, K S squared. How we solve this problem? If I want to use um, principle of work and energy, what I have is this. T1 plus summation of U12 equals T2. And we are dealing, the particle we are dealing with is the cart. 
And this is not the best quality card you can see is currently in the stock. Now, how much is the initial kinetic energy? It gives you the velocity, it gives you the mass, it's going to be half m v1 square, half 5,000, four square, right? And if you calculate that, Can you 40,000? Please calculate whatever I write, just double check because as I said, I use my cell phone and it's not as reliable. What is the unit here? The unit for kinetic energy. Joules. Joules, because this is kilogram, this is meter per second, is a standard, it's going to be joules. Right? 40,000 joules. Now, what is the final kinetic energy? How much is the final velocity? Zero. Zero, because we want the car to stop. So that was easy. How about summation of forces? So, uh, summation of work done here. If you look at the card, it's like I'm doing the free body diagram of the card, right? This is your card. You have mg, you have normal forces, and at this point, you have the force of a spring, right? We know that the vertical forces don't do anything, so we even don't consider them. This is the force that does the work. So the force is backward. The displacement is forward because the car keeps moving to the right. So if that's the case, summation of work done U12, which is going to be integration of summation of force, BS. Our S1 is zero. Our S2 is final S. The force is minus K S square. And the displacement is BS. You understand this, right? Ks square is force minus is because of force and displacement are in the opposite direction. And ds is that. So if you do that, and my final s, how much is the final s? The problem says this has to be 0.2 meter. So the work of external forces is integration from zero to two minus k s squared ds. You guys calculate this and give me the number. One minute to do it.
Did you guys get the same thing? Now, if you look at the work energy equation, we have T1, which is this guy. We have T2, which is zero, and U12, which is this guy. So if you substitute that, we are gonna get, oops, 40,000 minus K point oh eight divided by three equals zero, which means K is 120,000 divided by 008. It's going to be 15, 10 to the 6. What is the unit here? K doesn't get one because it's a constant. It is a constant, but some constants have units. If something is constant, doesn't mean it's unitless. And I just showed you how, how you can find the unit. Is it Newton's over meter? This is the equation, right? For the regular spring constant, when you say F equals K S, this K is Newton per meter. But now we have S square. So this K, whatever, let's just keep it the same. You know what, I'm just gonna turn it red. The red K here, the unit is Newton per meter square. So this is gonna be Newton per meter square. You may realize that we could solve this problem using Newton's second law, right? You have a force. If you look at this free body diagram, you have the force. You could find acceleration, then integrate acceleration over the displacement, relate initial final things, and that was much longer way to do it, right? Using energy makes it easier because you don't care about what happens in the middle initial and final and that's it okay any question So the next example is quite similar. The force and displacement relation is given. Some velocities are given. I'm not gonna do this right now. And we're gonna go to the next topic. Any question so far about the concept of work, how we calculate it, the work energy relation, the kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic energy is always positive. Okay, because it's half mv square mass is positive, velocity square is positive. Now we talk about uh, conservative forces and potential energy. You guys remember potential energy, right? Again, from your physics stuff. Did they talk about conservative forces? Yeah. Okay, we can skip this and go to the to the sol problem solving, right? Not really, I'm gonna remind you. So for those who don't remember, 
conservative forces are the forces that their work does not depend on the path of motion, only initial and final position, right? And you may say, do they even have a force like this? Because practically work is de defined by force times displacement. That how is possible that the work of a force doesn't depend on the path of motion? Is it possible? It's probably possible that we define this, but I already gave you two examples. If we go back here, when we say the work of gravity only depends on initial and final position and doesn't depend on the path of motion, then it makes gravity a conservative force. When we talk about spring, that the work of a spring only depends on initial and final position and doesn't matter how you get there, then the spring force becomes a conservative force. How about friction? Is friction a conservative force? Aaron, is it conservative force? Friction. And you can look at the equation. So this is friction force. This is its work. And delta S is literally how much it moves, the path of motion. Yes. So practically, the work of friction does depend on the path of motion, not just initial and final. I give an example, the same fridge example, right? You move it out of its position and put it back there. Is the work of friction zero? Because if you go from somewhere and go back there, no displacement. Is the work of friction zero? No, because as you move it from point A to B to do some move, right? You go from B to B to A, you do again some work. So friction is not conservative, but spring forces and gravitational forces are examples of conservative forces because as you see, the work of gravity only depends on initial final point. The work of a spring only depends on initial final point. Make sense? I'm going to make a pause here, give you four minutes of break. We're going to come back at 11.15, okay? <laughs> 